So it, it is showtime, uh, so to speak, as we talk about the greatest musicals ever. And as you can see, appearing on your screen live from a theater, uh, theaters have reopened, is Chris Jones. And we are very excited for our conversation with you, Chris, momentarily. I'm just going to do the briefest of introductions before we come to our conversation with Chris. I'm Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, I am especially proud to say that I am the Dean of the Graham School at the University of Chicago. Welcome to our gorgeous university, a place where big ideas are born that change and challenge the world. Uh, let me introduce you, for those who are new, to the Graham School. We are a big part of this university since the very beginning. Uh, we were actually one of the founding units uh, when it was started in 1890 by William Rainey Harper. And we were intended to help revolutionize university study in this country. And so I like to share that we actually began distance learning in 1895 when we started the first correspondence classes in the US for credit to help farmers who needed to be near their land during high crop yields, uh, but who still wanted to be able to continue their education. And we have been pioneering lifelong learning for now 131 years, trailblazing new ways to bring the great ideas of this university to the world. Uh, what we really are about at the Graham School is the liberal arts. We believe that a deep connection to the liberal arts across one's life can help to really enrich the way that we look at and understand the world. And we have a number of different programs, a master of liberal arts that is among the most respected and rigorous in the world, a basic program of liberal education where you can go deep into Western political and social thought over four years of cumulative education, an open enrollment program where you can dip your toe into different aspects of the liberal arts. And today we're going to peek into the class that Chris Jones is teaching in the autumn. And then we have annual programs that look at everything from the future of museum publishing over to how we can better know Chicago. I'll just say there are three things that in our mind distinguish what we do here. We have an incredible curricular idea behind each of the programs that we offer. And so we're really committed to the Socratic tradition and to making sure that everyone can have that kind of liberal arts education. Uh, we have incredible instruction and faculty and uh, the eminent scholars that are part of our team, you will get a sense of today because Chris Jones is a renowned author and critic and is an example of the incredible people that teach at the Graham School. And then finally, we have ambitious learners. And one of the things I've heard from my colleague Kendall Sharp is that we put the adult in adult learning. And what he means by that is when you come to classes at the Graham School, everyone else is as serious and as rigorous as you are. And so it's a place where people come to learn. Uh, they are not there for a credential. They are typically there because they want to better understand the world. And so you're in a classroom of others who share that intellectual energy and vibrancy. And with that, let me move into our actual reason for being here today, which is a conversation with Chris Jones. Uh, Chris is a very regarded uh, speaker. Uh, he is the editorial page editor of the Chicago Tribune. After spending two decades as the Tribune's theater critic, he continues to cover performing arts going forward. He received his PhD in theater in 1989 and has taught undergraduate and graduate classes for more than 25 years. We're proud to say the Graham School among the places he does so. Uh, his first book was published by the University of Chicago Press, Bigger, Brighter, Louder. Uh, and his most recent book, Rise Up, Broadway in American Society, From Angels in America to Hamilton, was published by Bloomsbury. And so with that, uh, Chris, let me welcome you. And um, let me just set the context for our discussion by saying that you are going to be teaching this autumn a class, The Greatest Musicals Ever, that is going to explore how musicals change the face of this most American art form. 
And I want to start by just asking you to kind of set the table for our discussion. So I'm hoping you can start by giving our audience, and I know it's a dangerous question for a theater critic, <laughs> a snapshot of the evolution you see in theater across basically the time period of your course from the 1940s as the war is ending to today. Uh, put another way, you know, from the evolution from, from Carousel in 1945 uh, to Hamilton, you know, uh, nearly 70 years later. Well, thank you, Seth. I just want to say it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. Hello, everybody. I see a couple of my former students in the uh, chat, which is really gratifying for me. I, um, I'm coming at you today from the beautiful uh, James M. Needlander Theater in downtown Chicago. I position myself in a box, which is a place a critic never gets to be in. <laughs> so you can see the auditorium. Uh, and one of the reasons that I'm uh, one of the reasons that I'm uh, I'm here is because there's a new musical um, that they're actually doing a preview of today called Paradise Square, which is opening in Chicago um, in a few weeks, and it's going to Broadway. It's the work of a producer called Garth Drabinsky. Uh, Drabinsky was the man responsible for Ragtime. Uh, for those of you in Chicago, at least, you'll remember that probably ragtime, which actually caused the restoration of the theater that I'm sitting in right now, uh, and Showboat, uh, similarly, um, part of the restoration of this theater. And really the rejuvenation of Chicago's loop began with this particular producer and this particular theater that I'm in. Um, I'm always reminded, uh, for those of you who, again, live in Chicago, there's a very interesting exhibit currently going on in Lincoln Park, um, that deals with the loss of the Garrick Theater, which was a beautiful theater that was torn down in the 1960s, about a block from where I'm coming to you right now, and really restarted the whole restoration movement in downtown Chicago. Um, that's uh, at the Wrightwood, the gallery on Wrightwood in Lincoln Park, if you're interested in that. Uh, so that's the context of why I'm sitting here in a theater, um, which is very exciting for me. I'm really proud to be part of the Graham School. Um, and I, to be absolutely honest, and I'm not blowing smoke like people do in these presentations, when I say that during the pandemic, uh, I taught a couple of Graham classes during the pandemic. And it was for me, kind of, it got me through it in many ways. I would go to my basement, which does not look anything like where I'm at right now. <laughs> and I would, I'd meet with these fascinating folks and some of them in my class had family members in other countries, in fact, and it was a very emotional experience for everybody, the entire, uh, the entire thing. So the Graham School has been really great for me. It's also Seth was kind enough to mention my book about, um, about really about the history of Chicago theater through the um, journalistic coverage of that theater. And it was, a really, really um, interesting book to research. And one of the things I researched actually, funnily enough, was the University of Chicago's role in, in Seth says, you know, educating ordinary Chicagoans. There was at one point, I found out, there was actually a billboard on the Kennedy Expressway or a stride what became the Kennedy, on the freeway, well, the forerunner of the Kennedy Expressway at least, coming into the city that would advertise University of Chicago lectures on Sophocles. And some of these lectures were taking place at venues like Soldier Field. And it was possible at one point <laughs> in Chicago to pull together 20, 30,000 people for a lecture from a University of Chicago professor on say Shakespeare or the Greeks. Uh, you know, a crowd that we would now only associate with, with the Bears games. And the other fascinating thing about that era was the great writer Thornton Wilder, uh, who's probably best known for the play Our Town, was also uh, a teaching at the University of Chicago. And I think was teaching in a program, if not this one, something quite similar to it at the period of, at the period of time he was there. And I always use that as evidence for uh, Thornton Wilder being really a Chicago writer. We don't always think of Thornton Wilder as a Chicago writer, but I, I'd argue that he truly was. He loved this city. He was happier here, his biographer said, more than any other place he'd ever been And while he was teaching at the University of Chicago. Uh, and he wrote Our Town, a lot of Our Town, um, while he was teaching uh, 
in a program like this. So it's a very auspicious, very high quality um, group of people uh, that I'm thrilled to be part of. So um, yeah, the, the, the course in it, the, the situation with musicals is a very, very interesting one. They have indeed gone from uh, uh, sort of great popularity, particularly with the rise of Rodgers and Hammerstein at the end of the Second World War, and they've really continued to be popular throughout that time. There have been slumps along the way. I think of slumps in the 1960s, Seth, or the early 1970s. And then there was a renaissance, really, in the 1980s and the 1990s. And really, it's continued all the way through, say, Hamilton. And if you look now, musicals have kind of found a new frontier, which is really streaming TV. Yeah. So, for example, you could see Hamilton um, in a very good uh, evocation of what it's like to see Hamilton at a theater like this. Also, Come From Away is, is available now. That's a fabulous show. That's also available. And um, also, um, there's a variety of other ones, too. In fact, one show, uh, Diana the Musical, which is a musical about Princess Diana, is actually going to be visible first on Netflix, and only then is it going to open to people like me. It's their way of getting around the critics, I think. But the, uh, <laughs> so the musicals, the musical is an abiding form. And in my job as a theater critic all these years, I've met so many people who are just fundamentally passionate about musicals. That they like all theater, but musicals are really what their thing is. Well, so um, let me just say that you gave me an idea. If, you know, the Bears end up leaving Soldier Field, yeah. I will go to Mayor Lightfoot and say, you know, the grand school has a solution. We have Shakespeare yeah. lectures and, and other opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's come back to your musicals idea, uh, Chris. So um, having heard that overview, you know, what in your mind makes a great musical? I mean, you know, we think about the bookends that you're describing, right? Carousel and Hamilton look very different, uh, but they have some elements in common. Uh, I'm curious, kind of across that, you know, very big spectrum, what do you think of the elements that, you know, the great musical share? Well, one, one of my creeds as a theater writer, as a theater critic, has always been that most great plays and most great musicals are about death. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just to sort of say that, generally speaking, they're about how we shuffle off this mortal coil at a time and place, not of our choosing, and without regard to observe, you know, without regard to our deserving. So that's true, obviously, of Hamlet. It's true of every great, every great Shakespearean play, and it's generally true about. Um, musicals too, that many of them are about mortality at the end of the day, even though, you know, we don't necessarily realize that. So, for example, if you look at, say, um, um, a musical like Les Miserables, you get to see Jean Valjean um, go about his moral life, and then at the end, he's reunited with all the people who've died, uh, and, and he's able to sort of have what you might call a compensatory heaven, which is a very strong impulse, of course, in Victor Hugo as well in French Romanticism, but, but also in that musical, that is fundamentally, fundamentally what it's saying. Many great musicals are about communities under pressure. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Um, if you look at, say, Fiddler on the Roof, for example, what you have there is you have a community the people in Anatevka who are, you know, trying to withstand the oppression of the forces that are trying to destroy their community. And in so doing, they are able to, you know, they're able to um, find things, strength within themselves in order to move on. So that's a very, very strong impulse in a lot of musicals, a community under pressure. And if you think about it, that applies to rent it applies to come from away. It applies to some degree to Oklahoma. So I, I think that is that you know that is a that is a another very good solid um, theme for a musical. I think, uh, and, I, and and that idea of a group of people who are under some kind of pressure. It's it's really if you want the magic formula for Broadway, you know, right here and now, that's probably that is probably you know what it is. Um, because it, it, it sort of fits the musical form very well. There are other, of course, there's other sort of deep, profound 
ideas in musicals, but two, many of them are very much about, for example, fertility or vitality. If you like, for example, one of the interesting things that I like to talk about with Rodgers and Hammerstein, for example, is a lot of people know um, the, uh, the musical Oklahoma, one of the most famous of all American musicals, which is fundamentally about a young woman, Laurie, of course, trying to decide between twin impulses within her. One of them is attracted to Curly, the nice, uh, you know, the nice farmer, the, the, the good guy, the guy she should be attracted to. And the other side of her is attracted to Judd Fry, who is kind of represents perhaps something more exciting for her, but also something more dangerous. And so that is, uh, that, that is and by the end, of course, she resolves it uh, in favor of Curly, mostly. And that's the sort of the trajectory of that musical, which is quite psychological in its approach. In Carousel, the same writers essentially split the character of Laurie in Oklahoma into two people. And they created um, uh, Julie Jordan and Carrie Snow, two young women, one of whom chooses a boring, nice guy who will take care of her, at least in that period, the way people thought about it things and another one is attracted to not a nice guy at all and thus you know her life plays out tragically in, in many ways so there you had an example of another big theme of musicals historically with sort of young people who are trying to find themselves so it's a very very um it, it's a very very interesting that's a sort of very very interesting trajectory musicals of course are very personal for the most part and they allow Unlike plays, perhaps you might say, they, they're structured in such a way as to really allow for characters to express their feelings. The idea that I have a monologue and this is what I am feeling. God on high, hear my prayer, that kind of thing, um, where characters are able to fundamentally tell us intimately um, what's going on with them. And you can see that everywhere from Pal Joey to Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, it's, it's that ability to emotionally communicate with a person. And that I think is a lot to do with why people love musicals so much. They find a very, very, very intimate connection. Well, so there is this personal dimension that you're describing um, and a related dimension in my mind because we are people in a society is this relationship between musicals and society and you know i read rise up and that's a theme that really runs through the whole book and also helps to tell the arc of how we move from you know the 1945's uh, examples um you know fiddler on the roof th those type all the way to where we are today in theater and so i'm curious if you could talk about both how musicals reflect society as well as how they change society and maybe give an example of each. Well, I, I think um, one of the dilemmas that a lot of people face when reviewing or when, when even when thinking about producing old musicals is the extent to which they do or don't reflect uh, contemporary values. So for example, if you look at say The King and I, which is many people would argue one of the greatest American musicals, it also now is very difficult to produce because it's a clearly a very sort of Anglo-centric view of the country of its setting. It makes a whole variety of what many people would consider to be colonial assumptions. It certainly, um, shall we say, flirts with stereotype if not fully embracing it. So it remains, that remains a very problematic show. And so I sort of understand that and, and I think that that is something that musicals um, have to face. It's different from film because film, you can sort of say, okay, well, here is the film of this thing. Here is this classic Hollywood film of this thing. And there's not really a debate about what the film is. It can't be changed. So the, there can be a debate about whether you should see it perhaps, but there cannot really be a debate about the content of the film. But right. theater, theater because it's live and can be constantly redone all the time there is a debate and it's interesting to sometimes see musicals that sort of get revived 
with different value systems reflecting their current era. There was a production of Oklahoma, for example, that did that. There was a production of West Side Story on Broadway last season that really didn't um, make a racial distinction between the Jets and the Sharks. There was no particular difference in the racial makeup of those two groups in that production. And I thought that was a very interesting way of sort of making West Side Story more relevant in, in today's society. So, you know, musicals, it's not just at the point where they're written that this is an issue. It's also kind of at the point where, where it is, um, you know, where they're produced. But just back to your other question about when have they changed society for the good? Well, I think it's incontrovertible that if you look at a show, um, if you look at uh, a musical like South Pacific, there's a song in that called they, they Have to Be Carefully Taught. And there is a fundamentally mostly sympathetic character who is revealed to be a racist in that musical, very clearly. Um, the, the show is quite harsh in, in its judgment of her, even though she is, structurally speaking, the heroine of the musical. And I think a good number of Americans, for a good number of Americans, particularly given the popularity of the movie, that that number, you've got to be carefully taught, probably introduce them to a social issue that they had, remember this is before the civil rights movement. Um, this was the first introduction for many, let's say Midwesterners to those sentiments, to those political feelings, to those ideas. And it was in that musical. And so I sometimes think to myself when someone says, yeah, well, there were all these problematic things in South Pacific. I sort of go, that's true. And that is absolutely true. But that has to be leavened, if you like, by an understanding of just how profoundly progressive that, um, that musical was for its era. You know, in many cases, the, the musicals have really pushed the envelope, so to speak. Like for example, Hair, definitely, uh, you know, it was very much on the side of, of the characters in that musical. And it was a very radical sort of statement. Um, I think sometimes it has an almost counter effect. I always think that the musical Rent, for example, actually contributed to the gentrification of Manhattan in its popularity, which was actually ironically precisely what it was arguing against. So <laughs> there can be, you know, sometimes there can be a, a sort of a change. Um, and, you know, as, as they, in the musical Hamilton, they talk a lot about legacy. You know, Lin-Manuel Miranda is a guy who sort of thought a lot about that. And, and he's, he often sort of says that you, you can't, you know, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And it's true that even Hamilton, even Hamilton, which is only now as we sit here, you know, four or five years old, there's already a shifting sands of opinion about that musical. Right. From, you know, it's fascinating to me because it's been, to me, it feels so recent. But in fact, musicals, they have to live in a kind of ever-changing environment because at the end of the day, they're like living, breathing entities, even though mm -hmm. they may have been first produced many decades ago. Well, so I'm going to come to audience questions very soon. Get your questions into the chat if you want to ask Chris Jones. Um, let me, though, ask about another theme in your book, Chris, which is, you know, this idea that musicals build. And so they don't throw away the past. Even when we see something theoretically revolutionary, like the Hamilton musical, it's actually evolutionary. And it's building and there's a way in which they're taking that kind of past foundation and adding to it, changing. But, but your book is about this evolution rather than revolution. And I'm curious if you can just speak to that idea in musicals and how you see this building over time. It's a great, it's a fantastic question. I, I think it's a key part of, I think it's a key part of how musicals operate that Again, if, just to mention Hamilton for a second, if you look closely at Hamilton, you can see echoes of Les Miserables, you can see echoes of Rodgers and Hammerstein, you can see it in the music, it quotes from the lyrics from those shows, it does the same thing with Rent. It, it's partly because a lot of people who work in musical theater have a kind of love of all musicals and they have tended to build on those ideas rather than reject them. And, and I think that is also, 
to do with the fact that musicals are fundamentally a populist art form. They, they are, they've always have been, they have usually had to live or die at the box office. Therefore, they have to pay uncommon attention to the desires of an ordinary person. An ordinary person with money to spend on a Saturday night, a little money maybe, and they wanna see a show. And are they gonna to go to this one? And therefore, they've had to really pay attention to the sort of the feelings, sort of the feelings of, of, of ordinary people. And I think that's been, that's been tremendously important. And many of the composers of musicals have really built, you know, historically on the work of previous generations. So for example, Oscar Hammerstein was Stephen Sondheim, great mentor. Stephen Sondheim was Jonathan Larson who wrote Men Rent's great mentor. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda adored the work of Jonathan Larson, which is why he wrote Hamilton. So generally speaking, musicals have tended to build on sort of the ideas of, of, of um, previous generations. The other thing I would say, and this is, might be a bit controversial, but I'll say it, musicals are generally better now than they were. And, and I, I, what I mean is that I think that they, <laughs> I think that they, there have been formative advances. Like people have gotten better at story. I think it's sort of in the way you might say TV's gotten better, which I think is true for the most part. Um, there are just people have got more accomplished at what the form is. And, and I think that's also, um, you know, a, a very important um, point as well. Uh, and so it's a, it's a kind of a fascinating uh, ecosystem set. Yeah, very fascinating. Um, and you have not only fascinated me, you fascinated our audience. And so many questions are incoming. I'm going to start with Anna Gumberg's, which is, who do you think is the best up and coming Chicago musical composer today? Uh, probably um, Alan Schmuckler, who I don't know if you know him. He um, He's actually working, he's mostly film scoring at the moment. He works with a guy called Michael Mahler, who you might have seen perform around town. He's a musical theater performer. Um, and he they have their own musicals. Um, and they're now, I think they were telling me they've just scored a new kids thing on Netflix. They're beautiful songwriters. And those are the two, that team, they still live in Chicago, at least Michael does. And I think they're very, very, um, very, very accomplished. So uh, there is more interest in that role that you serve as critic in the next question. Uh, Marsha Haas asks, how do you fit Stephen Sondheim in the history of musicals? And she acknowledges his very different approach uh, than Rodgers and Hammerstein. Well, Stephen Sondheim is kind of the god of musicals, as many of you probably know. He, uh, I, I'm a guy, when I got married, my lovely wife uh, 20 years ago our wedding program was entirely Sondheim music uh, in, including, oh. including the song Marry Me a Little which threw a lot of people off but it was but it was uh, he is for me sort of the lodestar of musicals you might say oh. uh, I even love his last musical Bounce or Roadshow as it became which I think is a much misunderstood oh. show and way better than a lot of people realize Sondheim is kind of a pure genius and also a sort of a mastery of a master of form. And, and I think that really, to answer your question, that's the answer. Many musicals are structured in a fairly, well, let's say most musicals are structured in a conventional way. And you watch them and you go, well, including the one I just saw a bit of this morning, it sounded, sounded great, but there was nothing in that music that I'd not heard before formatively. Sondheim wrote a series of musicals that were formatively incredibly important and experimental. And he tended to never write about, has tended, still going, writing another one reportedly, uh, has tended to write about offbeat topics, like let's just say adapted unusual things, that kind of thing. So he's, he really is um, the great genius of the musical theater and his tentacles, frankly, have extended well beyond him. I got to spend the day with him once at his house in New York. That was a great day, I'll never forget it. It was the greatest, one of the greatest days of my life. The greatest perk of the job was hanging out with him. Um, and it, it's, it, it's sort of fascinating. And he, 
I asked him this question actually about how how do you I don't know if you've ever anyone in the call has ever done this, but sometimes people can't answer a certain question very easily. And the question really was, how do you get to be, how do you understand so much about love and relationships? That anyone who's been in love or been married looks, listens to sometimes songs on those topics and goes, you get it, you absolutely get it. What gives you this sort of ability to do that? You know, and, and I said something like, can you articulate it? And he, he sort of demurred for the most part, but he, he pointed to um, the being alive emotion, which is fundamentally what in a Sondheim musical, to love is to be human, to love is to be alive. And if you don't love anybody, you may as well pack it in. And that ultimately is what most of his musicals say time and time again. It's our only hedge against oblivion, love. And I think that's, what, that's why we feel the way we feel about Santa. Oh, beautiful. I'm very fitting then that you had that music for your wedding. I'm <laughs> curious if you did musical vows, but I'll spare the audience <laughs> the answer. <laughs> Uh, so Barbara Bateman has two questions. I'm going to ask them in turn just because they're separate. Uh, the first is the future of musicals. Uh, she says one is streaming. What are your thoughts? Is it, uh, it meaning is, is streaming the future of musicals? Yeah. I mean, what do you see as the future of musicals and streaming is, is one she sees in that future, but no, she wants your yeah. thoughts on it. Streaming is a very complex, so th that is a subset of a question that I've been exploring in all facets of my job and life, which is, mm -hmm. are the changes wrought by the pandemic temporary? Well, we're going to go right back to the way we consume, say, theater before, live and in a theater like the one I'm sitting in, or have those changes become permanent, which is, which is to say, we are, we know, we're going to be streaming now. Like, and I don't think, I think it's hard to know the full answer to that, to be absolutely honest. Like, I would imagine that everybody on this call is delighted to be on Zoom. Like, you would not have wanted for my sorry self to have had to get in the car and drive to see me. You're probably like, well, this is actually a fairly convenient way of doing things. And so, and I would agree. So, when I look at that, I go, okay, so that logically will then get applied to the performing arts. That uh, definitely there are some people. Uh, I was at the opera, the Lyric Opera, Friday night, and they were they were streaming it. And I think it does streaming does have advantages um, for people who can't get to something. But the downside is that theater is fundamentally a live art, and its entire structure, its economic structure, its its uh, aesthetic structure all aspects of theater historically have been targeted to the live performance. And there's another industry known as film and television that does the other thing. And often the theater is ill-equipped to compete with it, shall we say. So I think it's a tricky conundrum and time will tell. So Barbara is also fascinated to hear your unconventional transition from critic to editorial oh, page editor, well, uh, although you. it might speak, and I don't want to uh, preview your answer because it's yours, uh, but to the connection between musicals and society that you referenced earlier. But let me ask you that question of, you know, how did that transition occur? Well, I, I wanted to, over the, for those of you who've read me in the Tribune for a while, you know, I write about lots of things and particularly about the intersection between culture and life in general. And I, I wanted to sort of be able to extend that idea and they needed somebody to help do that. And I thought I could do both at once, which may be foolish, but uh, I just sent a kid off to college. So I'm, I've got a bit of time on my hands. So I, I thought I'd, uh, I'm depressed, so I need something to do. So <laughs> I thought I would uh, sort, of a, sort of attempt both of those things. Um, um, and I, I do think that I, I do see uh, the arts as a crucial facet of the life of life in Chicago. I think it's a reason the the performing arts and the liberal arts and this power of the universities in this city and the power of the arts community are why people choose to live in Chicago. And they're always fragile. You know, the, it's interesting where I'm sitting right now, everything around me, um, you know, I've just had about, uh, a COVID test to get in this 
room. There's a lot of people walking around with a lot of sort of burdens and extra things they have to do that are expensive. It's it's going to be a tough road back for the arts in Chicago. It is going to be yeah. a tough road back. And I, I can't articulate that enough. I'm realizing now just how tough it is going to be. Um, and and I sort of I think my new job, too, I can sort of help with that and really focus on the fabric of the city because everything is everything is interconnected. So issues, for example, of public safety, that if people don't feel safe to come downtown, they won't come, that, that we have to make this city feel safe for everybody. We have to um, make the arts accessible to everybody. There has to be um, an awareness of that too. And, and, and I think all of these things for me are all a bit of a jigsaw. But, you know, Seth, I think mostly I've been, a, despite my lingering British accent, I've, I've, I have a, <laughs> I've been a Chicagoan for 30 years. I love this place. It, everything about what I've done and everything about me is sort of so, um, what's the word, inextricable from the city. And I'm so grateful to it because it, I feel like it's given me so much. Yeah. Uh, and which doesn't mean I'm blind to its problems, by the way, but I, I do think it's an extraordinary place. And I feel a bit like it's taken a, you know, it's taken a dip. It's going through a tough time. It's not unique in that, but it is something that we've all got to address together. Those of us who live in this city. Um, and it's important, I think. Well, thank you. It's very beautifully said. Um, coming back now to the, theater critic uh, in you. Um, we have a question from Michelle Goldberg. What are your thoughts on musicals as a vehicle for teaching history, such as Hamilton, Les Mis, Six? Well, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. I mean, musicals are, of course, fictional. <laughs> so <laughs> they, uh, I, you know, Hamilton is, you know, uh, the, I, I would say that the character of Hamilton in Hamilton is more sympathetic than Hamilton surely would be today to most progressive people like the ones that wrote the musical. But one of the things that Lynn was interested in in Hamilton was the reason that particular president made a great musical is that he, he lost a child. So in act two of Hamilton, all of the success of this fast talking brilliant guy that we see in act one is seen through the filter of somebody who has lost the, one of the, the, the thing he loves the most and, and blames himself. And would in fact, um, you know, would in fact give it all up to have that kid back. And it was funny. And so I think that's what it was about. It wasn't so much a historical impulse maybe as an emotional one, an emotional truth. You know, this may sound like a tangent, but I, it made me think of it. Um, I was watching a very, the very excellent Netflix documentary on the Bee Gees. If you never see, if you haven't seen that, it's very, very good, much better than those things usually are. And it's quite yeah. profound in its way. And at the end of it, um, Gary Gibbs says, all of his, you know, most of the, I think all, all of his brothers have died. And they're talking about all the success and all that. And the end, he just says, I'd give all of it up to have them all just back and go out for a drink with it. That would be better. I, none of this really means anything. And it's really a moving end. And that's sort of the conclusion that Hamilton arrives at. While we're on that show, uh, Denise Turner writes in, could you share more thoughts on the changing sentiments around Hamilton, referencing your uh, mention that, you know, just in the last five years, the sands have shifted from this being progressive and ahead of its time to it being, you know, in a place that is at odds with, with history and, and movement. And so, yeah, if you could just share more about how you've seen that transition show up. Well, I think one of the issues, obviously, is that there's pretty good evidence that Hamilton himself owned slaves, and that isn't mentioned in the musical uh, right. at all. And a lot of people have an issue with that and argue that I mean, some people would argue that a, a, an owner of slaves should not be glorified in the way that Hamilton is glorified. Some people would argue a more middle position, which is that it should at least be addressed and dealt with, shouldn't be kind of hidden under the table, you might say. And then there's another position that would argue that what's relevant is, is 
what was he doing in the context of the time? Um, but I would say that none of those arguments when Hamilton first appeared really were made very prominently, and I'm hearing them right. more now. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, and I'll acknowledge just on this point, I happen to be married to a historian at Northwestern who teaches a class uh, on the musical, and the thesis is it's an exhilarating work of art and a tragic work of history um, that, <laughs> interestingly, some of those voices may have even been there but in terms of visibility and interest in them, you know, that has also shifted as culture has shifted. So it's interesting to see how, you know, some of these voices that may have been very quiet in the context of the conversation, you know, five years ago now find a foothold in, in the new context. So I think there's you know, just multiple elements there that are really interesting. Yeah, um, but let me get back to you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, I think that it's important to remember that musicals have to relate to people. Right. So sometimes people say to me, what's Hamilton about? And I, my, my stock answer has been, it's a musical about work-life balance. <laughs> about work-life balance. Do you run? It, it's about this conundrum. Here's the thing to think about on a Tuesday lunchtime. This conundrum. Since we're all here for a brief amount of time, does it make sense to run and run and run and talk and talk and achieve everything? And logically, maybe it does because we're only here for a brief amount of time. But when you do that, you invariably sacrifice your personal life. Or does it make more sense to not do any of that and to simply appreciate the people that you love and your family because we're only here for a short amount of time? And that's a paradox that almost all of us are constantly ripped apart by, right? Depending on the day, we think one, that sometimes we think the other, the pandemic has brought that into a lot of people's minds. I think about it all the time and I constantly change my ideas on it. That's what the musical's about. Not really particularly about American history in some ways, mm -hmm. it's about that, you know. Well, um, on that note of connection, um, can I ask Dave Studeman's question, which is Showboat was so far ahead of its time not just in form, but in racial attitudes, did it have an impact on society as other well-known musicals? Yes, I'm, and I think that's very apropos because I'm sitting in the theater where it was, where it had its one of its very first productions. That was a, a hugely, a hugely important musical that is probably unplayable now. Like I haven't seen Showboat. I'm trying to think the last time anybody produced Showboat at a high level. I, I, I haven't seen Showboat in at least 10 years. And I'm not sure that anyone is about to do it for a whole variety of reasons. But in fact, as you say, Dave, it had, you know, it was ahead of its time. It was very progressive in its racial attitudes. It really did change how people thought. And that was early enough in the history of musicals uh, as to really, um, you know, as to really be important there. The revival that I don't know, Dave, if you remember that revival, it was, um, I guess it was the early 90s, the, the one produced by Garth Dabrinsky. But it was, it, it was a massive production, colossal. And it kind of was very much part of something that happened at the end of the 20th century in musicals, which was massive productions of things like helicopters and turntables, mostly British musicals that sort of, that sort of um, created enormous amounts of spectacle. A lot of people today poke fun at them. But one of the things they did was that they brought big shows into small towns. I remember once uh, I was working for Variety at the time and I went to Green Bay, Wisconsin and all of Green Bay came out on the street to see the Phantom of the Opera load into the theater in Green Bay. There were 27 trucks and everybody came out of the street to see it. And it was a big day in Green Bay when they got Phantom of the Opera. None of that would happen today because this was pre-digital scenery for one thing. So you would never truck around all that stuff. It just wouldn't be you know, viable, but it was, I remember it vividly. And so don't discount the power of bringing things to, you know, on the road. I mean, this was something that I'm a bit of a circus geek as well. Maybe I'll do a course on the circus sometime, but, you know, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, when they went into a small town, they blanketed that town. That was, they, that was a vacation for those towns for a long period of time um, because they brought excitement. That's, of course, one of the great themes of Carousel. Julie Jordan is sitting there in her mill, living a boring life in a boarding house, and up comes the Carousel with this handsome Barker. And 
the rest is just a, a ride that she really wants to go on. And, and that, of course, is what musicals offer. They offer glamour, you know, and excitement. And that's a huge part of their appeal. Well, so we are at time, Chris, but let me ask you one final kind of power round question uh, to end on a happy note here. Uh, theaters have just reopened after, you know, 18 months. Uh, what are you most excited about? Um, well, I'm excited to see the show uh, I've been looking at today, Paradise Square, because it's a pre-Broadway tryout in Chicago. And I love, there's nothing I like more myself than reviewing a brand new musical. I think it's the, I just think it's fascinating. And it, it's because it's so um, intricate, intricate to put a musical together. It's difficult to do. And often it takes a long time to iron it all out. And I have all these happy memories in my life of shows like The Producers or uh, Moving Out, all trying out here. And I got to see them at the very, very earliest part. And I, I'm very excited by that. I'm also, I found this at the opera on Friday too, that being in audiences right now is, is kind of an emotional experience. A lot of people have really missed sort of the live arts, that's number one. And, and at the opera on Friday, at the end of it, you could see on the part of the singers and the musicians, you could just see this relief that they were able to do again what they do. And, and yeah. the pandemic's been so terrible for live people who perform live. And it's like, it's one thing to say, okay, well, I miss going to the theater, but we've been able to watch things and Zoom things and all the rest of it. But for the artist who sings in an opera house to be able to do that again is a really an amazing thing. And to be able to watch them do that again is for me a great privilege, so. Well, what a wonderful way to end our conversation. And just to say out loud how grateful we are to have you as a Graham School instructor, Chris. Your insight and excellence is a very fitting role model and exemplar of, of what we believe in at Graham. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Yeah. I see a lot of others clapping and thanking you virtually. The one thing you do miss is that <laughs> applause at the end in this day. Um, and so uh, so we are absolutely applauding you and, and thankful for you. Uh, have a good day to everyone else. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Bye now.